Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Anesthesia and Analgesia Trauma Webinar, a part of a regular series from ANA and the International Anesthesia Research Society. Once a month, we like to highlight some of our best work. Uh, coming at the end of May, May was our trauma month, and the trauma-themed issue is the subject of this month's webinar. So next slide, please. I am your uh, executive section editor for trauma. And uh, as you can see on the slide, I'm the chief quality officer at US Anesthesia Partners. And I'm currently the chair of anesthesia at the University of Maryland Capital Region Medical Center, just outside Washington, DC. Next slide, please. Uh, these are my guest editors for the trauma themed edition. Um, and the, they are the section editors for uh, ANA. Um, I won't go through all the names, but you can see them. They are all distinguished individuals and put a lot of work into this issue of ANA, uh, for which I thank them. And I will now uh, go ahead and introduce the um, speakers uh, very quickly here. Um, first up talking, we'll be talking live uh, without Annette, Evan Pivaliza. He is a colleague of mine, recent colleague of mine, and Texas Society of Anesthesiologists. He's a passionate uh, clinician educator. He does trauma, liver transplant, neurospine anesthesia, or other complex high-risk uh, high cases. He practices at uh, the University of Texas, Texas Medical Center in Houston. He dabbles in clinical research, and he's an advocate for our specialty. He's a recent past president of the Texas Society of Anesthesiologists and uh, is engaged um, all sorts of things ranging from the Aston Villa Football Club, the USA Rugby, and the Houston Astros. Uh, following him uh, will be Dr. Uh, Josh Sappenfeld. He is the chair of the editorial committee for the Trauma Anesthesiology Society and a trauma anesthesiologist, obviously, in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Florida. He is also a liver transplant division. For some reason, trauma and liver transplant never get very far apart. And he is the medical director for the pre-surgical plant. Uh, he does research in trauma and education, as you will hear. And finally, uh, Dr. Ron Samet is an assistant professor of anesthesiology and the founder and director of regional anesthesia and acute pain management program at my own University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, he is a trauma. He uh, was a trauma and regional anesthesiologist at the Shock Trauma Center for many years, uh, part of my faculty there. Um, up to uh, about 10 years ago. And he was particularly instrumental in developing regional anesthesia techniques for acute trauma patients. Um, he's lectured uh, nationally on this and is an expert on ultrasound guided regional anesthesia uh, all over the world. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tracy to let us get our uh, webinar underway. Uh, this is being recorded and will be available on the ANA website and the IRS uh, YouTube channel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I presume I'm up. Um, this is Evan Pavliza. Thank you, Rick, for that very, very nice uh, introduction. And it was a pleasure being involved uh, you know, with your editorial talents. So thank you so much. Um, I've got the privilege of presenting uh, what I hope will be a little provocative and, and hopefully stimulate some discussion, uh, a paper on behalf of my co-authors. Um, and it was Association of Opioid Administration During General Anesthesia and then survival for severely injured trauma patients. And this was a pre-planned secondary analysis of the proper study. And there's the uh, link if you need it. Um, Rick uh, was very kind with my introduction. Distinguished teaching professor just means you've been there for a while. I'm still alive doing all the complex cases. A couple of disclosures for me. Um, this is coincidental, nothing to do with this presentation. I'm a medical consultant for Lucid Lane, which is a virtual a CBT platform to assist post-surgical patients managing their opioids. And I have future stock options if I ever retire. And then secondary, I'm, I'm a speaker for um, thrombolastography for human index. And um, none of those have an impact on this presentation. And we're certainly not going to discuss any uh, off-label or investigational use. 
Um, so hopefully there's a couple of folks um, on the webinar that may not be uh, experiencing trauma anesthesia. Um, those of us that are, are all familiar with this paper, which is unbelievably almost eight years old now, uh, the proper study, which is a pragmatic study of two balanced transfusion ratios, one to one to one of red cell plasma and FFP versus one to one to two, which uh, meant two red cells for every one plasma and one platelet. And these were acute trauma patients, either uh, in the midst of a massive transfusion or predicted to have a massive transfusion. There was an anesthesia study group led by Jean-Francois Bette, um, our recently retired editor of, of ANA, just did a fantastic job. And there were 12 centers, all with um, anesthesia representatives. And at that time, several secondary analyses were proposed, um, including this opioid one, um, but it was delayed from, for multiple reasons, mostly logistic and personnel. And we were fortunate two years ago, Dominique Levy, the first author here, and Colleen, the second author, uh, she worked uh, on a different uh, project, but Dominique was the primary for the opioid. This they started as their MS1, at the end of MS1 summer research program. And, and I just have to commend both of them. It was a huge amount of uh, work, as you'll see, and they've kept through it, even through the rigors of second year, and now third year med school. So we, here we are 18 months later, ha having uh, brought something to fruition. So I would just encourage anybody that's um, starting off in their career, um, stick to it, we, we can get a, a tangible result. The proper folks were fantastic. Um, you'll see several surgeons and um, researchers listed on the, um, on the as co-authors, uh, Aaron Fox in particular was a huge help uh, with the students. Um, you'll see several prominent anesthesia leaders from around the nation um, who, who were involved in the study listed as co-authors. And then I really had just outstanding statistical support um, from one of our internal medicine faculty, Sapita Sarakani. Um, I, I, she was going to try and be on the webinar because if you have any uh, serious questions about the stats, I'll defer to her. My, my statistical insight is, is pretty rudimentary. So the premise was that, um, and this was at this time, you know, eight years ago, very limited objective data on opioid use in the acute trauma um, perioperative scene. There were some excellent expert recommendations and opinions, some of which were institutional specific, and you'll recognize some of, our, some of the names here that are folks that have written um, and nice opinions for us. And Rick Dutton had even suggested, uh, and I think this was practice for, uh, or perhaps still is practice, at shock trauma that uh, they suggested titrating up your opioids as the patient achieved hemodynamic uh, stability. So this is all in the context of certainly in the elective population, you know, we're trying to limit opioids. We're all aware of the resuscitation priorities in patients that do show up in the OR or from the helipad with severe injury. We, we're trying to establish lines, we, we're getting hemostasis, we, we're getting uh, volume in the patient and the depth of anesthesia or the amount of opioids may not be your primary focus at that time. But nonetheless, we thought this was gonna be really useful as a contemporary analysis of opioid use across you know, 12 experienced trauma centers you know, from, from coast to coast. So to establish some hypothesis, um, we had some, there's some very preliminary sort of preclinical um, data, at least two that we're aware of, that the opioids may cause some vasodilation at the microcirculatory level. So our presumption was that an anesthetic with a higher opioid would be associated with improved survival. And that's what we used. The methods, um, so fortunately the proper database is housed at our local UT um, surgical research site. Um, we had RB approval, all the data we accessed was de-identified and, and we only used study number. And what this turned out to be was a retrospective analysis of prospectively collected data. The case report form, um, there were just two pages of anesthesia relevant information, um, very elementary and very little granularity. Uh, there were some drugs, a couple of doses, but um, nothing more than that. So for our purposes, we had to go back to the original records and of the 12 centers, 10 had electronic records, which were uh, reasonably easy. Uh, we were still paper at that time, which was a real challenge. And then one center didn't provide. So we had 11 centers worth of data. We used the consort guidelines, and then for, for just for ease of, of uh, aligning the two studies, we used the same outcomes as the original proper study. And then mortality, they looked at six hours, 24 hours, and 30 days. And then secondary, they had a, a, a huge number, 23 secondary outcomes, 
we try to focus on those that we thought would be relevant to that initial perioperative um, uh, exposure and of interest to anesthesiologists. So we focused on the lung, acute lung injury and, and ARDS combined that occurred in almost 30% of the total uh, proper cohort. Syst systemic inflammatory response, 65%, AKI, 23%, and then smaller for ventilator-associated pneumonia, and then for multi-organ failure. So those were the numbers on the original cohort. For the opioid data, data which was our variable of interest, we used um, the, the morphine uh, milligram equivalents per hour. We used anesthesia starting end times where it was available, if not surgery starting end time. And then the plan was to separate into a no opioid dose and then some equally sized opioid uh, dose groups, um, which I'll show you here shortly. Statistics, as I said, um, this was a little complicated. Um, there were really three steps. We firstly just looked at an unadjusted association of the variable with the opioid dose. And from that general, generalized linear mixed model, we uh, took covariates to make a final adjusted model. And those covariates didn't necessarily have to be statistically significant, just suggestive. And we added um, shock index, uh, which is just a very simple marker of hemodynamics. That was admission shock index as a fixed effect factor. And then finally, we did sensitivity analysis with those that remained alive at 24 hours. Um, and for those of you that, that are more familiar than me with um, some of the trauma data, the concern has always been survivor bias. And so if we reanalyze with those alive at 24 hours, um, we'd hopefully get a, um, a, a signal that, that would eliminate any acute um, mortality. And I'll show you some of the numbers, um, which were quite striking. So what did we find? 680 in the original proper study. So 579 had this urgent procedure uh, requiring anesthesia that could have been OR or interventional. We had to exclude 53 for missing data. Some of those were times and some were opioid dose. Um, and um, it, some of it was our, our own um, uh, written um, records, um, which, which were not very accurate. And we ended up with a no opioid group of 83, sizable. And then we were able to divide the opioid groups into four equal sizes by quartile. And we thought some of those dose ranges turned out to be clinically relevant. So it was you know, zero to five, uh, morphine milli uh, milligram equivalents per hour. The next one, you could say five to 10, the next one, 10 to 15, and the fourth group greater than 15. So we thought there was some differentiation um, there. Demographics, no surprises here. Uh, we're in a pretty cosmopolitan city, but young people and mostly male um, uh, are the ones that, that were in our uh, injured population. And ethnicity, uh, primarily Caucasian in the, the, the range is just showing the difference in the five groups, um, but we were representative of all um, ethnicities. And then treatment group assignment. So the, whether you received the one to one to one or one to one to two was the same in both groups. So that was uh, reassuring. However, no surprises here. The group that got no opioid had a much higher injury severity score of 34 compared to the others which were in the mid to upper 20s. A higher shock index, 1.4 versus uh, 1.1 to 1.2. More blunt injury, along with the lowest dose um, opioid group, and then a shorter anesthesia time in the order of uh, 30 to 60 minutes. So no surprises that no opioid group had a much higher um, injury um, um, burden. Mortality. Um, so um, the three separate analyses. Firstly, the unadjusted univariable, the no opioid group had higher mortality at all three time points. If you recall, six hours, 24 hours, and 30 days. When we repeated the sensitivity for those alive at 24 hours, that higher mortality persisted in the no opioid group. Of note, and you'll see in the original table, we lost um, over 50% of our initial sample. Um, from 83 to 41, whereas the opioid dose groups, there was very minor attrition. And just to look at it from um, 180 degree different viewpoint, when we did that adjusted analysis with the linear fixed model, any opioid was associated with a survival benefit compared to the no opioid, but essentially saying the, the same thing. So the no opioid group had a persistent association with uh, higher mortality. Morbidity um, was a little um, less consistent. 
um, in that first bucket of unadjusted univariable associations, it looked like the no, no opioid group had lower systemic inflammatory response. With adjusted analyses with the linear mixed model, that lower SIRS persisted in the no opioid group. But again, not surprisingly, when we repeated the analysis with those alive at 24 hours, that SIRS effect uh, disappeared. And, and again, this was a classic example of survivor bias because if you haven't survived up to 24 hours, you're, you, you don't have time to manifest any of those um, SIRS um, criteria. So mortality was pretty clear, morbidity um, inconsistent. Um. So what do we take home? Um, after adjustment of multiple variables, it appeared that the administration of any opioid was associated with lower mortality in a severely injured cohort of, of trauma patients. And, and both us and our reviewers, um, who were extremely helpful, um, were, were emphasizing this association. That's all we've shown, it's just an association. And interestingly enough, no significant differentiation between the four opioid dose groups um, and themselves. Strengths of our study um, was a large, you could almost call it a prospective database because it was contemporary trauma anesthesia uh, across the nation at 12 centers or, or 11 that we analyzed. Um, limitations are several. Um, if you recall, the, the anesthetic management, doses, drug selection was not protocolized or randomized and therefore not powered for the study. Um, so there were obvious uh, institutional and individual anesthesiologist uh, choice. Um, in our group, unfortunately, 9% of that core, the original cohort had missing data. Despite um, adjustments, the no opioid group were clearly more severely injured, as, as I showed you. Uh, and I mentioned this already, the, the no opioid group, um, that 50% um, will turn out to be 50.6% yeah, mortality at 24 hours. Um, so that group became smaller. And the, 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 the challenge for us is we've got a very finite perioperative time. The mean was about two and a half to three and a half hours. We did, we're looking at one intervention, which is just opioid uh, dose exposure, not knowing anything about the patient's pre-existing opioid use. Um, so it's challenging to, to, to sort of take away what our a finding of association as to what clinical impact that would have on somebody's subsequent 30-day hospital stay um, and can't emphasize sufficiently that these findings were associations only. Where do we go from here? Clearly, um, there's this, this preclinical data and there's certainly clinical enthusiasm for, for um, titrated opioid dose and trauma from, from several experienced um, anesthesiologists. This does appear to be a basis for, for an objective study. Um, the challenges would be, it would have to be multicenter, it would have to be pragmatic. It would be a real challenge to randomize. And if we did uh, able, if we were able to do that, um, knowing that we're having to be pretty um, conservative with our doses in a hemodynamically unstable patient, it would be a real challenge to manage the sedative hypnotic uh, volatile um, component of that. So that was our study in a nutshell. Thank you so much for your uh, time. I'll be happy to take any questions and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. We're gonna roll over to Dr. Sappenfeld now. Uh, but as noted in the chat, if you have a question for any of our speakers today, we will have a little time for Q&A. Please type it into the Q&A tab on Zoom. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Joshua Sapafield. I'm the corresponding author, author for training anesthesiology residents to care for the traumatically injured. And it's my uh, pleasure to talk to you today about this topic. So first, disclosures. I have no financial or conflict of interest that I need to disclose with this topic uh, made in this, this presentation. Uh, I have a lot to cover in, in 15 minutes, but I'll give a brief background on why this is important. We'll talk about uh, how learners retain information, uh, the three main learning cognitive uh, learning domains, cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. And we'll talk about my opinion on future directions. So background. First, trauma is the leading cause of death in patients between the ages of 1 and 44, and is the third leading cause overall. 
So it's a big deal. Second, people will probably be taking care of a non-fellowship trained anesthesiologist. More than 16% of patients live more than 60 minutes away from a level one or level two trauma center. More than 31% live greater than 45 minutes. And then even if they come to level one trauma two or level one or level two trauma center, uh, most likely the person there will not have had a trauma anesthesia fellowship. There is peer reviewed publications stating that trauma surgeons are concerned that anesthesiologists treat trauma patients as if they're elective patients with hemorrhage and hemodynamic instability. And while I can't say that's true or not, uh, when I was a resident, ACGME had a separate category for trauma. Now it includes trauma and burn cases and complex life threatening injuries. So the more active a learner is and their uh, gathering of information, the more they're going to remember. And so there's no substitution for simulation or real world clinical experience. Uh, but if the person's been involved with the case and is able to reflect on it and actually have a discussion about that and, and connect that with information, they're going to retain more than just someone watching a video or shadowing other people's. And that's going to be even better than hearing a lecture or podcast or, or reading a book. However, due to the vast amount of knowledge and the vast amount of knowledge that's coming in every year on taking care of traumatically injured patients, there's going to be no substitute for individual reading or those kinds of things. We are not able to give a simulation or case-based discussion on every single topic that is uh, germane to taking care of traumatically injured patients. So, as I said, real-world clinical experience is the best. Um, that's where you have someone that directly observes a trainee. However, the key to getting the most from this uh, scenario is tiny structured learner centric feedback, uh, having some sort of post event debrief and uh, my colleague and uh, the United Kingdom said that they use the stop structure there. It's a summary of the event, things that went well, opportunities for improvement and points of action. But having something like that uh, is important to getting the most from their their experience. Case based discussions can be used here. But usually the case based discussion, the learner may go uh, and do some research on their own, find out what information is relevant to the case they had. And by the time they get back to discussing it with other people, their colleagues and such, uh, a lot more time may have elapsed and some of the information might be lost. Uh, simulators are good. Uh, we have simulate patients like they do in ATLS. We have task trainers, uh, computerized patient simulators. Some of these are fairly high fidelity and virtual reality. The key to simulators, though, is having faculty who are trained and experienced in debriefing and providing effective feedback. Having that safe environment to explore, discuss, make mistakes, learn from the mistakes and such in a constructive manner is going to create more productive outcomes, greater retention information than having someplace uh, that's defensive uh, where the person uh, feels like they have to demonstrate their ability and those kinds of things. Case-based discussions are great. Um, this is where someone has a case where something bad may have happened, may not, and they read the literature. They look at what's available, um, both online, their textbooks, talk with colleagues, allows a chance for them to personally reflect on the scenario, things they liked about what they did, things they would have done different, connect those things, and then present it in a safe environment. If you have other learners there as well, they actually might learn information from what the other person discussed. Um, but having that interaction there, a chance to have further inflection will increase the amount they re retain with, with their experience. Problem-based learning discussions are very similar. Uh, it can be a fictional case or it could be a semi-fictional case, something that a faculty member or a teacher has experienced that they've tweaked to better fit a um, this kind of discussion. The nice thing about PBLD is it can be standardized for all participants. Everyone at the table will get the same experience from the facilitator. And actually, they can actually take that scenario and give it to a faculty member at another institution and have a very similar PBLD. And so it's a great way to package information and discuss core topics that are related to drama. Um, and the nice thing about PBLD is it gives you the ability to explore multiple decision points. At each decision point, you could have a discussion about your management 
or factors that I would factor manage or send you down a different pathway. And you can do this over one topic where someone could use the same scenario, change a few things between different discussions and have a completely different discussion and focus on different events and such. And so it's a very useful tool. I would like to give a shout out to the Society of Pediatric Anesthesia. I provided the link here in my talk. It's also in our paper. I think they did the best describing how to make an effective PBLD, the kinds of things that you shoot for and, and how you structure it to have the best learning experience. Passive learning, shadowing, watching videos, discussion-based forums, lectures, podcasts, social media books, there is gonna be no substitute. Based on how much material needs to be covered, there has to be some independent um, responsibility to gathering information. And you just cannot have uh, enough uh, in the room experience simulation or PBLDs to make up for it. There, there's just too much information to fit it in uh, and have a, a faculty member or program responsible for everything. And, and so well, that's gonna be that's gonna, someone's gonna be the responsibility of the learner to get for themselves. So learning domains, uh, the ones that we focus on the most heavily is cognitive, uh, core knowledge, um, which is covered in the ABA content outlines. Um, one of the things that we do acknowledge and think about is psychomotor, um, which is your technical skills, which is on the, the OSCE content outlines, and the effective domain, the, the non-technical skills. Um, and these are, are not so much skills that you get from reading the books. In fact, I don't know what your experience is, but some of the people I've seen the most reading of books actually have the lowest and the uh, effective domain. And so I don't think there's any, I don't think reading more books is going to help in that area. So um, attached to the paper, we have appendices that went through every line of the certification outlines, both initial and maintenance of certification where I and other co-author independently reviewed all the information um, and put it out there for you. We also have some summaries, and this is just a snippet of the summary. I don't have enough time to go through all the summary. But essentially, uh, when we looked at just the trauma heading and the initial certification content online, uh, we thought there was a lot missing. Uh, however, when we went through the whole uh, content outline. There was a lot of things we thought were related to trauma that wasn't included in the trauma subheading. In fact, we did surveys with the Committee for Trauma and Emergency Preparedness with the ASA and surveys with the Trauma Anesthesia Society and, and couldn't find anything that was actually missing from the core, core information in the cognitive learning domain on those outlines if you looked at everything. Uh, just some examples uh, for airway management. Not only do you have difficult airways for elective cases, but now that you have edema, injuries, uh, Sometimes you have to do inline stabilization and stabilization because of suspected injury and such. Uh, you're more likely to have a difficult airway and trauma. Uh, most of your patients are coming in with a full stomach. Um, and then hypothermia is probably the classic tri triad for resuscitation, uh, hypothermia, hemorrhage, and coagulopathy. And so some of these things that we thought were germane to trauma wasn't actually in the, the trauma section. Uh, it will have to be covered in a robust um, res anesthesiology residency. Technical skills, point of care ultrasound, arterial lines, epidurals, cricothyroidotomy. I think we'll all agree that no matter how many books or podcasts you listen to, you're not going to get the skill set you need to do these things, actually touching something. Uh, patients, task trainers, those kinds of things. Luckily, task trainers have been shown to be effective at teaching these skills, and those skills are transferable to human patients. And so there are other ways to obtain this besides just doing it on humans. Um, I also recommend Cadaver Lab. I have not ever personally performed a cricothyroidotomy on one of my patients, uh, knock on wood. Uh, but uh, with the wet labs I've done um, and with the simulation stuff, I feel confident that if I had to, that I would be able to perform a cricothyroidotomy. So the effective domain is the one that I was not familiar when I, I started working on this uh, project with my co-authors uh, early on, uh, but I was educated by my co-authors how important this is. From an educational standpoint, this is the receiving, responding, valuing, organization, characterization of data. And 
that doesn't mean as much to me, but for me, this is the decision making, situational awareness, interpersonal communication. And these are very high yield for someone taking care of patients in a crisis scenario, uh, such as trauma. Uh, in our paper, we found two validated scoring algorithms for a team's ability to um, do well in the effective domain. Uh, one of the ones that seemed very well researched was the trauma no tech score. The five areas that covers is leadership, cooperation and resource management, communication interaction, assessment, decision making, institutional awareness, and coping with stress. And actually, they've studied how much it costs to raise a team one point on this trauma no tech score. They've done um, studies on, on what's the effect uh, of the score and the time to uh, different resuscitation endpoints uh, and how it affects institutions and stuff. And so uh, the trauma no tech score would be good at evaluating people at how they perform in the effective domain, but also could be a tool for guiding teaching uh, and, and simulate scenarios. Um, for that domain uh, in the future. So my personal opinion, uh, things that are gonna be stable with training residents in the United States is there's gonna be variable case exposure inside programs between programs. Uh, I did my tra training in Baltimore where we had 8,000 trauma admissions a year. Uh, I now work at a place that has 2,000 trauma admission years. There's just not the same number of patients and cases coming in uh, between those two cases. And there's no way you could standardize that between institutions. Um, and even inside institutions, depending on what month you do a rotation, depending on what days you come on, uh, some days are going to be have more trauma than others. Um, Friday or Saturday night comes to mind. Uh, summer comes to mind. It's just not going to be possible to standardize the experience between all residents. I also don't see us changing who's taking care of trauma patients. I think it's going to still be general anesthesiologists. I don't think it's reasonable to have every single trauma patient in the United States cared for by someone who's done a trauma anesthesia fellowship. And I also don't see the public expectation for current, relevant, good quality care to diminish. I think they're still going to expect you to know what you're doing, despite the increasing amounts of knowledge and the, the changing fields and such. What, what is evolving is the amount of clinical knowledge in the field of trauma. And we're gonna to have to do something to keep up. And so that's gonna involve learning both in training and outside of training. I think we're gonna see further standardization of clinical readiness. Uh, I've seen more and more practice guidelines uh, in institutions and um, in societies. I also think we're going to have pooling available resources for training. We already have the anesthesiology toolbox uh, that's shared between multiple residents trainings that has stuff like PBLDs, lectures, uh, question banks, those kind of things. I think we're going to have more information available uh, for multiple programs. And lastly, I think there's going to be globalization of research, training, and standards. There's already been multiple guidelines that are, have been accepted by multiple societies where they come out with one consistent guidelines. We already have things like the anesthesia toolbox, which I think people in other countries can use. Um, and then there's already collaboration over multiple countries for research and the ability to publish that. So in summary, trauma is an important thing. It's one of the leading causes of death in the United States. Retention of information is dependent on how much, how active participants are in their learning scenario. With simulation and real world experience having the highest impact on how much they retain with lectures and podcasts and stuff being the least. However, you're not going to be able to replace that with simulation and real-world experience. And I think all this is going to be important to provide high-level quality care traumatically injured, uh, which you'd want your family members, your patients receiving. Uh, I'll be available after the talk for further questions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ron Samet. I'm an anesthesiologist at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. I work at the R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center, where I practice trauma anesthesiology as well as regional anesthesiology. And I am excited to talk to you today about peripheral nerve blockade and patients at risk for acute, acute compartment syndrome. Our article is actually a pro-con debate discussing whether or not peripheral nerve blocks should be provided in patients with acute extremity trauma. I'd like to thank my co-authors, and I'd like to thank Anesthesia and Analgesia, and of course, Dr. Dutton, one of my mentors, and his co-authors with a great editorial that they provided for our article. I have no financial disclosures for this talk. 
Patients who uh, suffer a trauma, their most common complaint is often pain. And as, as anesthesiologists, one of our main objectives is really to provide great analgesia. And there's many different modalities, as we all know. Peripheral nerve blockade has really taken a resurgence in the last decade or so in terms of being able to provide targeted regional anesthesia and analgesia for these patients. Um, while there isn't great data in the trauma population, many of the elective uh, studies studies on elective patients, uh, many of those outcomes and benefits really do transfer over to the trauma population as well. The conundrum we have sometimes, though, is in patients who have acute extremity trauma. In those patients, uh, there is a phenomenon called an acute compartment syndrome, which many of us know about. Uh, it's often associated with a fracture with some soft tissue injury, which leads to swelling within the compartments, which obviously at some point will collapse many of the vessels that leads to hypoxia, ischemia, and muscle death, as well as uh, potentially loss of limb function, loss of limb, and occasionally some systemic manifestations. So really catastrophic complications that might occur from an acute compartment syndrome. The real treatment for acute compartment syndrome, as we all know, if it's detected early enough, is to provide uh, fasciotomies to open up those compartments, release the pressure, thereby allow the blood flow to resume. If one does that early enough, most of the time patients can suffer no sequela. Uh, however, if it is caught too late, patients again may have those catastrophic uh, con consequences. How do you detect an acute compartment syndrome early enough? Um, we do not have great signs and symptoms. We do have sort of very nonspecific signs and symptoms. Disproportionate pain or pain out of proportion of the injury is often considered one of the hallmark signs, although in and of itself is not a good enough sign. We look for the five Ps, pain, pulselessness, pallor, paresthesias, and paralysis. And uh, those are sometimes some of the earliest symptoms that we can look for as patients begin to develop an acute compartment syndrome. Now, the uh, controversy that surrounds peripheral nerve blocks with regional anesthesia and acute compartment syndrome really stems from an article in 1996 where Heider et al. described a three-in-one block, primarily a femoral block or fasciliaca block, that potentially caused the masking of increased pain from acute compartment syndrome of the lower leg. And this article has been uh, questioned in many different studies within the regional anesthesia and anesthesia literature. But be that as it may, uh, this was really the beginning of the teaching that nerve blocks are contraindicated in patients who are potentially at risk for acute compartment syndrome. Since then, in the last uh, 12, 13 years, there's been multiple articles demonstrating that patients can often have a peripheral nerve block even at risk of an acute compartment syndrome. And interestingly, at times, the peripheral nerve block and the regional analgesia that the patient had was in fact to the benefit of the patient of discovering that the patient had an acute compartment syndrome that began to develop. Um, and so the question really does become, what do we do in these patients that come into your hospital and they have an acute injury uh, to, for example, the tibial plateau or the tibial shaft, maybe a both bone forearm fracture. How do we address these patients? What types of uh, analgesics can we provide them? And is regional anesthesia appropriate, even though they may be at risk for an acute compartment syndrome? And so this is constantly the debate between anesthesia, orthopedics, or anesthesia and the trauma team. Can we do peripheral nerve blocks in this patient, in this patient population, or are they contraindicated? So our article really tries to address this from a pro-con debate. Uh, it's clearly not a, um, a topic that will have significant data or randomized trials in this regard, uh, primarily because of the concern that if we miss an acute compartment syndrome, it really has devastating effects to the patient. And a lot of people just sort of shy away from providing that kind of analgesia. So when we think about what are different options, uh, one should reconsider that if one does not provide a regional anesthetic, often one will need systemic medications. Uh, that will come in the form of fentanyl or morphine or hydromorphone. Um, sometimes patients will get ketamine. And if patients are in severe pain, especially preoperatively, they might even be intubated and sedated. So it's interesting how we are trying to avoid a regional anesthetic because we might miss in acute compartment syndrome, and yet 
The alternative is to give systemic analgesics, which also will often sedate the patient quite significantly. So in this regard, one would argue that if the regional anesthetics are done, especially if they're modified and they are not a dense concentration of anesthetic, but rather an analgesic, a lot of these patients might in fact do relatively well um, where they still have a certain amount of sensory function, a certain amount of motor function, and they might be the first ones to tell you that they are experiencing what one would call disproportionate pain. Additionally, peripheral nerve blocks come in all kinds of uh, styles these days. In, in the past, there was a very high prevalence of uh, single-shot uh, injections, but now with the advent of ultrasound-guided nerve block catheters that have become much more frequent, one can provide a dilute local anesthetic and uh, often shut it off and have a neuro exam return in a very short period of time. And one can assess for acute compartment syndrome in that regard. So in if one tailors the regional anesthetic, one would argue that providing peripheral nerve blocks in these patients actually is much better. It's more isolated. Patients remain more awake, more alert, more communicative, and in fact, might be the first to highlight whether or not they're developing disproportionate pain. Additionally, when patients get a nerve block catheter, there often comes along a acute pain service that will then round on this patient, whether they round once a day or twice a day or are just available uh, at any time, 24-7, to address uh, any kind of issues with their particular patient. Often, the acute pain service are available to go and see patients when they are complaining of anything that seems a little bit abnormal, whether it be paresthesias or disproportionate pain. And they might be the first team to highlight that this patient is developing an acute compartment syndrome. You can contrast that with patients that do not get any kind of nerve block, do not get a regional anesthetic, and remain on maybe the orthopedic or trauma service. And those uh, residents or trainees or providers might be in the operating room at the time the patient might be complaining, may not be able to get seen in a timely fashion. So the acute pain service, together with the regional anesthetics, might be, again, as pointed out in some of the articles, uh, the first team to arrive bedside to assess for a patient who might be developing an acute compartment syndrome. Also, additionally, it is uh, always very troubling to see how patients are selected, um, or I should say are non-selected uh, in this particular uh, situation. Often when we have a patient that has a tibial fracture, for example, that usually will be translated to that patient cannot get a peripheral nerve block because it might be, it might we might mask an acute compartment syndrome. Yet many Patients come in many different fashions. There are patients who are very high risk, ballistic injuries, young males uh, that might have some significant soft tissue injury. Those patients might be at a high risk of acute compartment syndrome, whereas patients, you know, an elderly female who might have suffered a tibia fracture but is going to get a plate and it's been a couple of days out, she's really not at risk for an acute compartment syndrome. And yet, we have selectively, we have standardized the whole approach and said that these patients are contraindicated to peripheral, to peripheral nerve blockade. I think that's a mistake. And uh, one would argue that if one can tailor their local anesthetic and find the right patients and select them appropriately, many of the patients uh, that duly deserve a regional anesthetic would be getting them without a real risk of an acute compartment syndrome. And this could also be uh, borne out from some of the data in terms of who really is at risk for acute compartment syndrome, patients with open fractures, crush injuries, uh, tibial plateaus, tibial shaft fractures, penetrating injuries, whereas in other patients that maybe have a closed injury, uh, non not significantly traumatic in terms of uh, soft tissue injury, those patients probably should be able to get a regional anesthetic. And finally, in the last decade or so, Dr. Bozart out in Gainesville has made a strong argument that based on various different case reports that sometimes patients actually have a great motor sensory block and yet they still have ischemic pain or acute compartment syndrome pain. And the question really is, is the pathways that we're familiar with, the somatic pathways that transmit motor sensory function, uh, are those the same pathways that are transmitting ischemic pain? Uh, and Dr. Bozart has made the argument with some of his colleagues that in fact, there are nerves that surround the perivascularature uh, those nerves might in fact be the ones transmitting ischemic pain. And there are circumstances where patients could have a dense motor sensory block, which one would advocate for, uh, and yet still have 
the ability to transmit ischemic pain and disclose that they're having uh, disproportionate pain and be able to disclose it in early developing acute compartment syndrome. So this is actually very new data and data that should really be strongly considered in terms of recognizing the ability to provide peripheral nerve blocks in patients that are potentially at risk for acute compartment syndrome as long as they do not block those specific nerves that are perivascular that would transmit the ischemic pain. The con side of uh, the argument, though, really takes many of the same arguments that the pro side of the, of the uh, debate uh, takes, but recognizes that we don't always have experts in all of the different places that are providing care for our trauma patients. First, let's remember that we have very nonspecific signs, so disproportionate pain, paresthesias, paralysis. Nerve blocks really do a fantastic job at eliminating pain and really do modify your uh, neurologic exam. And so anything that would impair that uh, is a risk. Well, one would argue to say, well, why don't you provide opioids? Well, the, the, and, and maybe potentially retain that neurologic function. Well, if the catastrophic result might be loss of limb uh, to a patient, it, this is so significant that, patient, that providers often will shy away from anything that puts people at risk. And one cannot really know which patients are going to develop that acute compartment syndrome. Additionally, as mentioned earlier, uh, we're now in the uh, era of enhanced recovery after surgery protocols and in trying to standardize many, many different types of analgesics for our patient population. And so while enhanced recovery after surgery and standardization works very well for this particular patient population, it does not work well because there are definitely going to be patients that are at enhanced risk or uh, real significant risk of an acute compartment syndrome. And yet, if we just put them on that assembly line and provide them peripheral nerve blocks, we will miss some patients. And again, like I said, the results can be catastrophic. Also, if one looks at an acute pain service that comes and does peripheral nerve blocks, for example, and you look at the articles, you'll find that most of the time when a, pain, when a patient complains of disproportionate pain, the provider that's on the acute pain service actually comes and boluses the catheters with an acute uh, and more dense analgesic or sometimes an anesthetic to provide good analgesia for that patient, which really is the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here. Here, we're trying to provide a, a, a dilute block and ensure that the patient still has a good neurologic exam. And yet, if you have an acute pain service that comes by, often they will uh, bolus these catheters, which can, again, lead to the devastating consequences that we do sometimes see. In terms of uh, Dr. Bozart's argument that the nerve pathways might be different, that is true in many of the nerve blocks that we do, but in the most common nerve blocks that we do, supraclavicular blocks, femoral blocks, axillary blocks, many of those nerves that are perivascular are in the same area that when one blocks the somatic nerves will also block those particular nerves. And so to, to uh, sort of convince oneself that they can do a motor sensory block and not block those uh, sympathetic nerves that are transmitting the ischemic pain, that might be uh, very delusional, especially when you're doing it in the area in which the local anesthetic surrounds not only somatic nerves, but also the vasculature. I think we're going to get to the day where hopefully we're not reliant on these nonspecific uh, signs and symptoms, but rather we could look at IM partial pressure of oxygen, IM pH, IM glucose, other modalities to be able to detect uh, early onset of an acute compartment syndrome, and thereby we could still provide great analgesia, but not compromise patients' safety. So I think uh, we're looking at the future. We need to collaborate better with our colleagues. There are definitely many significant benefits of regional anesthesia, even in this patient population. But we have to critically analyze every particular patient and think about whether or not for this particular patient, we're going to do be doing something that's going to uh, give them tremendous benefit or put them at great risk. And we have to understand that we're working with, often within a system that may not be able to monitor appropriately, that may not be able to address or provide a fasciotomy in a timely fashion. If that be the case, one should probably err on the side and being more conservative. And finally, you know, within your own institution, thinking about quality improvement initiatives that be able to follow uh, your patient population, maybe choosing a specific patient population and ensuring that you have the right protocols might uh, be really the right approach at being able to provide patient-centric care in this trauma population. Thank you very much for your time and look forward to any questions in the chat.
All right, everybody. Welcome back. My thanks uh, to the speakers for doing an excellent job. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Pivaleza. Uh, you've had many questions on the same uh, thought, which is the no opioid group, obviously very sick, dying, didn't get any anesthesia at all, probably. So in answering those, you can, you can cover my question too, which is the difference between no anesthesia and any anesthesia and why that might matter uh, and help our patients. And then maybe get into the more subtle question about, okay, if we're gonna anesthetize the patient, does it matter whether we use a volatile or opioid or something else? So Evan, over to you. Thank you, and, and I've tried to keep up with some of the questions in the chat, so I hope you know, I've, I've answered you um, those questions, and, and that is, you know, it's a limitation of our study. We, it was a ret we were looking back at what we did, so there was almost no way for us to determine what the anesthesia team was thinking when they gave X amount of opioid. Um, we are trying to look at the anesthetic drugs as a separate um, study. It just got too complicated to look at everything uh, in between, and I think one of the questions related to ketamine and this was, I guess, the study was probably 2014, so that's almost nine years ago. Certainly, I think in my own practice, I was using less ketamine at that time, and now uh, I'm certainly going to be trying to work in low-dose um, ketamine as frequently as I can in those patients. But um, that's the challenge, Rick. We have, you know, there's always this talk about awareness in uh, trauma patients. Um, the data hasn't been as convincing as I'd like, and so surprisingly, a lot of these folks have less awareness than we think, knowing that we've, we've just given by our elective terms an inadequate you know, depth of anesthesia or an in, inadequate amount of opioids. And, and the opioids, even that we studied, yes, there was a group that was greater than 15 milligrams um, equivalent per hour. You know, if you're not giving much else in terms of volatile or any other uh, uh, adjuvant, that's not a very big dose of opioid for somebody who's usually getting either multiple procedures or, or a massive, you know, uh, abdominal and, and even a chest incision. Um, so I don't know that I have any further answers in that um, other than the fact that it's an association and then to answer several of the questions in the chat box, um, yes, that, that's unfortunately our, our take home is that those patients were more severely injured and we probably didn't give them as much intentionally. I think somebody asked about whether that would be bias and it wouldn't be bias in the traditional research sense, it would be our own clinical bias to say, hey, I've got to get this patient's blood pressure restored first before I, I either add some more fentanyl or whatever you're using or even dial up the, the anesthetic. Um, does that answer your, your question, Rick? I, I, it's probably not the ideal answer, but I don't have any other uh, data. As, as you know, because we've talked, we've been thinking about this for 20 or 25 years. And my observation is the patients that you can get deeply anesthetized uh, while well, they're bleeding, do better. There's data from elective surgery where the patient's anesthetized first and then bleeds that they do better than trauma patients with equivalent amounts of blood loss and matched injuries, but it's all retrospective and observational and therefore biased. Um, to the person in the chat who asked a question about animal studies, one of the right. yeah. weird problems with setting this up in animals is we can't have an unanesthetized un animal group. It wouldn't be ethical. So think about that for a second. Let me, uh, let me switch to Dr. Samet. Um, some questions about specific uh, medication choice and then the cut to the chase question. What do you do in your practice? Are your orthopedic surgeons convinced? Great, great questions. Um, the bottom line is that the... Uh, a lot of it's provider dependent, depending on who the anesthesiologist is, who the orthopedist is, what the situation with the patient is. Ultimately, uh, we, we do our best at selecting the right patients and having a good conversation. Sometimes we are successful. Sometimes we're able to sort of convince the other side. Sometimes the other side is able to convince us that this might not be the right patient to appropriately block. The bottom line is though that you know, if patients end up in excruciating pain, somehow a couple hours later, the orthopedist all of a sudden allows us to go ahead and block that patient because we've tried methadone and Valium and uh, hydromorphone and everything else that we have in our toolbox. So, you know, one just has to be considerate. And when one practices, especially post-operative analgesia, it should just be that, post-operative analgesia, not anesthesia, 
There's no reason to give patients dense blocks that will completely eliminate their neuro exam. And believe it or not, 0.0625% bupivacaine does a wonderful job in the obstetric population. It can also do a wonderful job in many of our trauma patients. And considering using less local anesthetic, more dilute local anesthetic, catheters that you can turn on and off, I think is the right approach. So I don't have a good answer. We don't have an official protocol. Uh, maybe in, in the days of AI, uh, we could all work together and figuring out what the exact, how to fight, find the right patients and the right protocols. But um, it's just, it should always be a conversation. It should never be, this is absolutely contraindicated. Let's just move on. Yep, never black and white. Uh, Josh, question for you, and I'll get to the cut to the chase question again also. Um, the difference between a checklist for trauma skills, that is, you must have done so many high volume central lines, or you must have done a surgical craniothoracotomy, or you must have done these simulation exercises, versus a dedicated trauma rotation, a month at shock trauma or the University of Miami or San Francisco General, uh, where you do just trauma and get to participate in the whole team function. What are your thoughts about that? And what do you do at the University of Florida? Oh, so those are, those are two separate questions. Um, so, I, I mean, some of my colleagues um, who've been uh, evaluating people for different skill sets, um, the, the, there's the, the statement, I know it when I see it. Um, I don't know how to grade that. I don't have to make it standardized, but people, when they watch performance, whether it's in a trauma scenario, whether it's performing different skills, when they see it, they can recognize proficiency and competence and they can see how the person performs it. And I don't have a great answer on how to standardize that across institutions. Um, I know where I trained for trauma, I was very comfortable handling trauma resuscitation um, and handled big cases. Um, I mean, fairly independently, I guess as a fellow, I still had someone looking over my shoulder, um, but I could do it. And I, I was confident and people were confident in my ability. Um, and I don't know how to replicate that. And I don't know what sort of systems have to be in place to make sure that each pocket of training is able to, to give the same uh, training and have the same expectation. And so I don't have a good answer for your first question, but I think there, there has to be something. Uh, that's not overly onerous and complicated. As far as our institution, um, most of the residents uh, get it during their mole rotation. Um, most of the, the cases we do at night uh, are either trauma that comes in, in the middle of the night or, or something else like an aortic dissection or, or some sort of transplant. And so they get a lot of their uh, resuscitation uh, with an attending who, who is comfortable taking care of trauma injured patients at night. Um, and frequently it's one-on-one -on -one then at that point in time or two-on-one, -on -one, two residents in the same room with one attending, uh, taking care of traumatically injured patients. And so I think we do a fairly good job of training residents here um, uh, how to resuscitate patients. Thank you. And thanks to all the speakers. I have one more question for the organizers. Um, I'll ask it and then I'll talk for another minute and then I'll hand it to you to answer. Uh, which is the question in the chat about CME. I don't know the answer, but I will uh, hand that over to you in just a sec. I want to thank all of you for participating in the talk. I want to thank the speakers for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate your time. With that, I will hand it over to you and we'll be concluded. Hi, uh, CME is not offered for this webinar, unfortunately. Thank you, Tracy. Pure knowledge, <laughs> we got it here. Uh, if anybody does have uh, further questions, our speakers have done a nice job of answering a lot of them individually in the chat. And you can, you can look at those. Uh, uh, my email, richard.dutton at usap.com. Please email me any questions you might have, and I will be happy to put you in touch with the appropriate speaker. With that, we're going to wrap up. I thank all of you for participating and the speakers uh, for giving their time and doing the research, writing the papers, and this presentation. Thank you all very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.